Welcome back to Linear Algebra. I'm Dr. Jeff Groh. Today, we're going to talk about elementary matrices and the LU factorization. Suppose I perform one elementary row operation on the identity matrix. Let's start with the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. The first kind of elementary row operation is to interchange rows. Let's consider E1 to be 0, 1, 1, 0, the matrix obtained by reversing the rows of the identity matrix above. Now, let's look at the effect of multiplying another matrix by this matrix. Let's take E1 and multiply it by a matrix. 0, 1, 1, 0. And let's multiply it by A, B, C, D, E, F and see what happens. Notice that when we multiply by the first row, we'll pick up D, E, and F. And then when we multiply by the second row, we'll get A, B, and C. As you can see, we can accomplish the elementary row operation of interchanging the two rows of the matrix M by multiplying by the elementary matrix E1. The second elementary row operation is to multiply a row by some constant. Let's suppose we multiply the first row of the identity matrix by K. And now what happens if we multiply E2 times a matrix? Let's take K0, 0, 0, 1 and multiply by A, B, C, D, E, F. When we multiply by the first row, we get k times each of the entries in the first row of the matrix M. And when we multiply the second row, we just pick up the second row of M. So multiplying by the elementary row operation obtained by performing one application of the second elementary row operation on the identity matrix results in that second elementary row operation. We've seen that we can convert the first two elementary row operations into matrix multiplications. Can we do that with the third elementary row operation? Let's suppose we multiply the first row by k and add to the second row. That doesn't change the first row, but k times 1 plus 0 is k, and then 1. What happens when we multiply this matrix times some matrix M? Clearly when we multiply the first row, we'll just pick out the first row of the matrix M. When we multiply the second row, we'll get K times A plus D and then k times b plus e, k times c plus f. We take k times the first row and add to the second row. We make the following definition. elementary matrix is a matrix obtained by one elementary row operation applied to the identity matrix.
Also, we have the following fact. If R is a row operation, then the row operation applied to that matrix is the elementary row, is the elementary matrix times the matrix A. Here, we're assuming that E is the row operation applied to the identity. Note, if R1, R2, through R sub K, if this is a sequence of elementary row operations, and E sub I is R sub I applied to the identity, then what happens if you apply R sub K, R sub K minus one through R sub one onto a matrix A? What you get is E sub K times E sub one applied to A. We have the following theorem. If E is an elementary matrix, then E is invertible and its inverse is and elementary matrix. This is pretty easy to prove. Let's suppose that E is an elementary matrix representing the interchange of two rows. Notice that E times E switches its own rows back to the identity. In this case, the inverse of E is E itself. Every matrix representing the rearrangement of two rows is its own inverse. This also proves that such a matrix is invertible, besides the fact that the determinant is not zero, negative one in this case. If E is of the form K001, note that E inverse would be one over K zero, zero, one. In other words, to reverse multiplying a row through by a constant K, you multiply through by one over K. Also, if E is of the form one zero K one, if E represents the elementary row operation of multiplying the first row by K and adding to the second row, E inverse will be 1, 0, minus K, 1. You can see this. We'll multiply that second matrix up here. We'll have 1 and 0. K and minus K cancel out, and then 0 and 1, giving the identity matrix. It only stands to reason. To reverse multiplying the first row by K and adding to the second row, multiply the first row by negative K and add to the second row. I want to take special note of something. If an elementary matrix represents reversing two rows, you always get minus one. After all, whenever you switch two rows in a determinant, it just changes the sign. The identity matrix has a determinant of one. So if you interchange any two rows, the determinant of the resulting matrix must be minus one. Also, if you have an elementary rep matrix representing the multiplication of a row by a constant K, the determinant of that is K. If the elementary matrix represents the third elementary row operation of multiplying a row by a constant and adding to a new row, that does not change 
the determinant at all, as you might expect. Recall the following definition. matrices A and B are row equivalent if there is a sequence of elementary row operations transform one into the other. So there will be a sequence of row operations which applied to one gives you the other matrix. It follows then that A and B are row equivalent if and only if there is a sequence of elementary matrices E1, E2, through EK such that when you apply these matrices, you get the other matrix. Recall that when we tried to find the inverse to a matrix, we took the matrix and it butted it to the identity matrix, performed elementary row operations to get the reduced row echelon form until we had the identity on the left. Then whatever appeared on the right was the inverse, but that only works if you get the identity on the left. That implies then the matrix is invertible if and only if it is row equivalent to the identity matrix. That means now there have to be elementary row operations that, when applied to A, gives you the identity matrix. But it says more. It says A can be found by multiplying by the inverse of this matrix on the left of the identity matrix. Well, we can forget about the identity matrix. What matters here is you get E1 inverse, E2 inverse times EK inverse, which means the matrix A can be expressed as the product of the inverses of elementary matrices. But remember, the inverse of an elementary matrix is an elementary matrix. That means if a matrix is invertible, then it can be expressed as the product of elementary matrices. Let's write that down as a theorem. If A is invertible, then it may be expressed as a product of elementary matrices. Let's write down a little lemma. A lemma is a theorem that is not important in its own right so much as it helps us prove a more important theorem. If E1 is an elementary matrix representing the first elementary row operation, the 
first type of elementary row operation. E2 is of the second type where you multiply a row by a constant. And E3 is of the third type. We know how these elementary row operations affect the determinant. The determinant of E1 times A is minus the determinant of A, because when you switch the rows of the matrix, it changes the determinant by a minus sign. Two. The determinant of E2 times A is going to be K times the determinant of A, assuming that K is the constant factor multiplied through by one row. And the third elementary row operation should have no effect on the determinant at all. Now another little lemma. If A is expressible as a product of elementary matrices, then the determinant of A is the product of the determinants of those elementary matrices. The proof is by induction. If A is an elementary matrix, that implies the determinant if A is the determinant of that elementary matrix. Suppose the theorem is true for some K and the matrix A is E K plus one, E K through E one. Then the determinant of A is the determinant of E K plus one times the determinant of everything else. And then that, and then we imply the induction hypothesis to get the determinant of EK all the way down to the determinant of one on what is left over. From this, we can finally prove that the determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Let's suppose that A is invertible. Then we have just seen that A can be expressed as a product of elementary matrices. Thus, the determinant of AB is the determinant of EK through E1 times B. Each of these elementary matrices can be broken off. Determinant of EK down to the determinant of E1 all times the determinant of B. But then we know that the determinant of EK times down to the determinant of E1 is the determinant of A. And so we get the, the determinant of A times the determinant of B. What happens in the case, though, that A is not invertible? You'll recall that when A is not invertible, we perform elementary row operations until we get something over here on the left where you have a row of zeros. If you end up with a row of zeros, then there is no inverse, which means that if A is not invertible, then it is row equivalent to a matrix having a row of zeros. So if A is singular, meaning it's not invertible, then it is row equivalent to a matrix U having a row of zeros. 
That means if you apply a sequence of elementary row operations to A, you get this matrix U that has, that also means that A is E1 inverse through EK inverse times U. The determinant of A will be the determinant of E1 inverse times the determinant of EK inverse times the determinant of U. But U has a row of zeros. And that means you get zero for the determinant. This implies that the determinant of A is zero, which we already knew. What does that imply about the determinant of A times B? If you have, let's say, AB zero, zero, and you multiply that by CDEF, what does this row of zeros do on the product? Well, you get some number here, some number here, but you'll get zero and then zero. So whatever you get in these other, in the first row, you will get zeros in the row matching the row of zeros in the first factor in the product. Here's what that tells us about AB. If you perform those elementary row operations on the left here, you end up with U times B, where U has a row of zeros. But if you multiply U times B, this also has a row of zeros. When you take the determinant You get the determinant of UB, and that's zero. Well, we know these are not zero. That implies, then, that the determinant of AB is zero. Therefore, the determinant of AB will be the determinant of A times the determinant of B, even so. The determinant of A is assumed to be zero. The determinant of AB is also zero. This last theorem shows, as an immediate corollary, A and B are both n by n matrices, and A is singular, then AB is singular. There's no matrix you can multiply by in order to make this product non-singular. We're now going to talk about LU factorization. And we're going to suppose that we can perform a sequence of elementary row operations yielding a row echelon form. And the row echelon form is upper triangular. You will have the generic form of stuff up here, but zeros down below the main diagonal. What does this mean? This means that A can be set equal to E1 inverse through EK inverse times U. But I want to make one further assumption. Assume none of the elementary row operations are of the first type. So none of them represent swapping rows. I want to look at what happens with these elementary row operations. Notice that in row operation of the second type is lower triangular. Let's say we use L and 1. A row operation of the second type is also lower triangular. And if we multiply these lower triangular matrices we get a lower triangular matrix. 
So all of the elementary row operations of types 2 and 3 are lower triangular. And when you multiply them, you end up with something that is lower triangular. You can see then that if there are no row swaps, we can multiply these lower triangular elementary matrices times A and end up with something that is upper triangular. But what is more, you can solve for A by multiplying by the inverses in reverse order. And the product of lower triangular matrices is lower triangular. The inverse of these lower triangular matrices is also lower triangular. We're going to call all of the products of these inverses of these elementary row operations put in reverse order. We're going to call that L. And we end up with what is called the LU decomposition or LU factorization of A. L is L1 inverse L times through LK inverse. U is the upper triangular matrix that is the row echelon form. Now let me give you a motivation There are a lot of numerical algorithms where you want to solve AX equals B1, and then you want to solve AX equals B2, and so on, a large number of times, perhaps millions of times. But you go through the same sequence of elementary row operations in reducing A to the reduced row echelon form every single time, no matter what you put in there for B. You can save yourself a lot of computational time by setting this up using LU factorization. Here's what you do. A can be decomposed as LU. We'll set Y equal to UX. Then Step one, we'll solve Ly equals B, where we'll have figured out what L is from the sequence of elementary row operations on, on the matrix A. Step two, now that you have Y, you solve Ux equals Y for X. You only have to figure out the matrix L and the matrix U once. Let's do an example real quick. What's the first elementary row operation you want to perform? I say, let's multiply the first row through by one third. The outcome of E1 times A will be one, two, negative 1, 6, 15, negative 5, negative 1, negative 2, 6. The second elementary row operation that I'd like to perform is I'd like to multiply row 1 by negative 6 and add to the second row. It follows then that E2, E1, A is 1, 2 minus 1. Negative 6 times this plus this is 0. Negative 6 times this plus this is 3. Negative 6 times this plus this is 1. The third elementary row operation, E3, will be to add a copy of the first row to the third row. E3 times E2, E1A, then gives us 1, 2, minus 1, 0, 3, 1, and then 0, 0, and then 5. This is in an upper triangular form, and we may stop there. The matrix L was 
E1 inverse, E2 inverse, E3 inverse. E1 was multiplication through by one third. Here, we'll multiply through by three. E2 was multiplication of the first row by negative six and adding to the second row. So we'll just reverse that. And E3 was to add the first row to the last row. We'll reverse that. So what is the lower matrix L? We'll leave this first matrix off for a moment. Multiplying the last, we'll get 1, 0, 0. 6, and then 1 and 0, and then finally negative 1, 0, 1. Now multiplying the top row through by 3, we get 3, 0, 0, 6, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1. Now, suppose we wish to solve ax equals b, where b is 3, 11, 9. How then do we solve this? Remember, A is L, U times X. We'll set Y equal to U, X and solve L, Y equals B first. This is easy to do because L is lower triangular. And then we can just back substitute. The first entry will be 1. If the first entry is 1 to get 11, the next entry had better be 5. And then if the first entry is 1, the last entry here had better be 10. Now that we have y, we have to solve ux equals y. Remember what u is. u was 1, 2, negative 1. The second row was 0, 3, 1. And the last row was 0, 0, 5. We now make the right hand sides 1, 5, and 10. We can see that z will be 2. If z is 2, then y had better be 1. If z is 2 and y is 1, X had better be 1. So we get, by back substitution, the solution in both cases when we're doing the Ly equals B side or the Ux equals Y side. It's just back substitution all the way. What happens if there are row interchanges, though? I want you to consider a permutation matrix obtained by permuting the rows of the identity matrix. Let's do 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 0, 0. You can see we've mixed up the rows of the identity matrix here. What happens if we take P times some matrix M? So let's take 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, and multiply by A, B, C, B, E, F, G, H, I. When you multiply the first row, it picks out the middle row, D, E, and F. Multiplying by the middle row picks out the last row, G, H, I. And then when we multiply by this last row, it'll pick out the first row, A, B, and C. So you can see in the way in which you mix up the rows of the identity matrix, that's exactly how multiplying by P on the left will mix up the rows of the matrix M. It follows then that we can always factorize a matrix A into PLU and then we'll solve PLUX equals B. D 
the permutation matrix is always invertible, which means you can convert a PLU factorization into an LU factorization by multiplying both sides by P inverse. And then you're off to the races. I want to show you something about Gaussian elimination or LU factorization and the stability or instability of solving systems of equations with finite precision arithmetic. Let's suppose that we have a system that we're trying to solve, 0, 0.00. Let's put five zeros and then a one. And let's suppose that our machine only has three digit accuracy. So I'm going to make the lower left 1.00, 2.00. And we're going to solve this with the right hand side equal to 1.00 say 3.00. Well, I don't know about your calculator, but my calculator is giving me that the corresponding system of equations has solution 1.12345 zeros followed by a 2. And y is 0 0.12345. But I want to keep in mind we're constraining ourselves to work with three-digit accuracy. Anything else will be thrown away. Note, in three decimal accuracy arithmetic, if I add 1.00 to 0 0.000001, I'll still get 1.00. What is the LU factorization? The first elementary row operation might be to get a zero in this spot. To do that, you'd multiply by one times 10 to the power of six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So the first elementary matrix would be one, zero, 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 one, zero, and then one, zero, 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 zero and then one, zero, zero. But to zero out this entry, you would want to multiply by negative one million. Negative one million times this plus this gives you a zero in this spot by design. But if I multiply one by negative one million, and add to two, I get negative one million. Because I only have three digit precision. So it's going to drop any digits after this point here. Multiplying by negative one million and adding to three, I still get negative one million. We can divide the second row through by one million, negative one million. And then to get a zero in this spot, we need to multiply the second row by negative one and add to the first. And then multiplying through by one million. We end up with 0, 0.00 and 1.00. Notice this is quite a bit off from the solution that we found using our calculators just a minute ago. We're getting x equals 0, 0.00, y equals 1.00. Before, according to my calculator, we had x equals 1.00002 and y equals 0 0.999999. Nine. 
0.999999 is pretty close to 1.00, but 1.000002 doesn't look like 0.00 to me. So we have a significant error that resulted from round off because we're allowing only three digit precision arithmetic in this particular instance. We could improve our precision, but you can always find whatever precision you choose for a machine is always finite. You can always choose some small error that leads to big errors in your answers. What is more, there is nothing you can do to fix this if you're sticking to finite precision arithmetic, which if you're using a computer to solve problems, you are. We say that Gaussian elimination is unstable. Small round off errors in your arithmetic can lead to big errors in your answers. You can see why people don't trust numerical answers. Small round off can lead to big numerical garbage in the end.